Watch this. There's a resolution rolling around Idaho State House that would put a limit on legislative districts. Is 35 the number we're good with? There's a lot of potential college students in Idaho's small towns who may not have the means to get there. The president of Boise State was once in their shoes. Now she's hoping to help pave a path. And one of our viewers wants to know, what's with the trash along the highway? Why isn't it being picked up as quickly as it's being put down? Should we be able to make changes to the Idaho's constitution? Well, sure, it's just not exactly easy. But some Idaho House lawmakers hope to do just that, one that would keep Idaho's legislative districts at 35. That's where it is now. Well, this bill now heads to the Senate, where if two-thirds of the Senate vote yes, then the voters would get to decide in November if, in fact, we want to keep districts at 35. No more, no less. So why does that number matter? Well, Joe Paris talked through an idea with House Speaker Scott Bedke. You know, we want more representation and smaller legislative districts, and that's what this would help do. This is House Joint Resolution 4. So, Scott Bedke, what would this constitutional amendment do? To keep the number of legislative districts at 35. Idaho has been at that number for more than three decades, but the state constitution actually allows for less, as few as 30 districts. But Bedke and his co-sponsors say they want to amend the Constitution to avoid having less than 35. Here's why. If we have fewer districts, then they just have to get larger geographically. And we have some right now that span nearly from Oregon clear to Montana. So why now? We only redistrict the state every 10 years. And so this is the last chance we'll get to change it before we do the redistricting process. And so it's important that everybody get counted, and then it's important that we draw the lines in a way that is fair uh, to all citizens. Speaker Bedke says this won't gerrymander districts, meaning the amendment isn't meant to redraw the districts for political gain. This has nothing to do with gerrymandering. This has nothing to do with the makeup of the redistricting commission. People have been worried about that, but this, this doesn't change one thing there. If the number of districts is lowered, just doing the math and we all would represent more citizens and then you as a citizen would have less access to your legislator. So the resolution passed the House with 65 yes votes and only three no votes. We wanted to know why were there only three no votes? Republican Priscilla Giddings tells me that she voted no in part because the entire state Republican Party, she says, passed a resolution saying in part that they strongly encourage the Idaho legislature to entertain a bill to change the Idaho Constitution to a legislature that consists of no more, no, sorry, not less than 35 and no more than 45. And she says because it doesn't do that, she doesn't want to go along with this idea. She adds that this actually would also cost $200,000 just to maintain the status quo. Meanwhile, Democrat John McCrossey says that he voted no because generally he is not in support of altering the Constitution without a very important need. He adds that until the marriage equality ban is removed from the Idaho Constitution, he will not be supporting any constitutional amendments. Brian, again, it passed the House. It'll now go to the Senate. And if it gets two thirds support there, it'll be on your ballot in November. OK, so Representative Giddings wants to go the other direction. Increase it tonight to 45. The downside of that would be what? I know that some people are concerned that if you add districts, then you would be creating new areas and that at the point you would have to be drawing lines and then there's concerns with gerrymandering. Uh, and again, that's redrawing districts. Yeah. So there would be a political gain for one party or another. People were really upset with that some. And so I think that the idea behind Speaker Bedke's idea is to keep it at 35. So there's no concerns about gerrymandering. OK, so it's not about a number of representatives or people that are in. I got gotcha. you. It's about the because like Idaho County is huge. Yeah, but it's got this roughly it's supposed to have the same amount of people as the other counties because each representative is supposed to represent the same amount of people. That's why some of these counties are so big because you have to go so far yeah. to find the same amount of people. And the fear is if you have less districts, then you're going to have even bigger counties. And practically, it's tough for legislators to get all the way across a huge area to represent all their constituents. All right, we'll see. Could be a vote to us. We could decide this if it goes that far. All right, thank you, Joe. Idaho is close to getting rid of so-called preferential treatment when it comes to hiring practices. Well, what some call preferences, others would call affirmative action. Representative Heather Scott's House Bill 440 passed the House on a near party line vote of 55 to 15. 
It's now in the Senate, and if it passes there and is signed by Governor Brad Little, it would make it illegal for government employers in Idaho to hire someone based on their race or gender, something Scott referred to during yesterday's debate as, quote, only immutable traits, traits that you cannot hide or rather something you cannot change. Scott says people should be hired based on their job qualifications. I reached out to Representative Scott to ask if there was a need for this kind of legislation in Idaho. As in, what example does she have of anyone being passed over for a job because they weren't a woman or a minority or vice versa? She has yet to respond to my questions. By the way, a state eliminating affirmative action practices isn't against federal law. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled they aren't illegal and nine states, including Arizona, California and Washington, have already enacted similar bans. Representative Fred Wood of Burley was the only Republican, by the way, to vote against House Bill 440. Here's something on the opposite side of the spectrum from Representative Scott's bill. What if there were or there was more weight given to where you came from, what language is your first, whether you actually have a permanent home or not, when it comes to what school you can attend? Right now, public charter schools are an answer to just sending your kid to the neighborhood school. I know it's a simplistic view, but public charter schools give more leeway to teachers to use innovative methods to provide a quality education, which is why a lot of parents choose to send their kids there. They are tuition free, but they're also part of public school districts, meaning they get the same amount of state funding and have to follow the same rules as the elementary school down the street. Who gets to go there, though? Their enrollment policies, they're all decided differently. Like all public schools in Idaho, charter schools have an open enrollment policy, but they can only accept so many. So when they reach student capacity, everyone else is put into a lottery system. That way, if a spot opens up, everyone has an equal chance of being admitted. Well, that could change thanks to proposed legislation from Blake Yude. He's an education lobbyist and former spokesman for the State Board of Education. And his bill would allow public charter schools to give additional chances to their enrollment lotteries to specific groups of students, like students who have English as a language barrier, uh, homeless students, students in foster care, students with disabilities, at-risk students, and economically disadvantaged students. There are already some adjustments, by the way, that apply when it comes to these types of school lotteries, like the children of the charter school founders, they get preferential treatment, or if their parents work at the school. Not chosen, your kids just head to the dreaded waiting list. That bill is currently sitting in the House Education Committee. So many folks who were so talented, gifted, but who wanted to stay in their communities with their families, and so they never went to school. So many talented people that never fully developed those talents. She grew up in a small mining town in southwestern Wyoming. Neither her mom or her dad had their college degrees, but she wanted hers. So she earned college scholarships, hoping to one day become a medical doctor. It was her family's financial challenges. They were way too real for her, though. Medical school stayed a far off dream. But she became a doctor anyway, with a PhD in English, and this morning, Boise State President Dr. Marlene Trump set in place a program to help students who are just like she was. At the State House, while Governor Brad Little proclaimed today Boise State Day, Dr. Trump announced a new scholarship that would help first generation Idaho College students from rural communities get their degrees. She says students from these communities, as you just heard, have been neglected by other universities because of where they grew up. Because college graduates don't just earn more than a million dollars more over the course of their lifetime. They spend more time with their families. They give back more to their communities. So the impact of having that degree is so profound on communities. And if we can get into those rural communities and help those students be successful, we'll keep the movie theaters open and the grocery stores open and the health care centers open. If people are not having to migrate from rural communities into the city in order to do their degree, that's why she says this program is so important. Along with the scholarship, Boise State will create a rural outreach program called the Community Initiative, where Boise State staff will go into these tiny towns and ask students what kind of programs they need to be successful. They're also developing a hybrid model of making education more accessible to those students so they can stay closer to home. That is, if they have to stay home and work to help their families. You asked, we have the answer. It's a dirty job, but it's getting done about as well as it can be. And one more question. Why is a white cane the only one that's allowed to be used by blind people? We dive deeper into the Gem State statutes. 
Want us to dive deeper into another issue? Tell us all about it. Send us a text or an email. We take pride in the 208 being a conversation, a back and forth between us and our viewers on a daily basis. Sometimes it's in real time. If you have a comment or a question during the show, we can respond to it, usually during or at the end of the show. Sometimes it takes us a couple days, though, like this question sent in by Corliss, who drives the connector to downtown Boise and asked us a couple of times, why is there trash and weeds piling up on the connector? They're not cleaned up, especially along the mid barrier. I think we should be able to do a better job. Well, the we Corliss is referring to is, is just happens to be the Ada County Sheriff's Office. The ACSO is responsible for all sections of Interstate 84 and Ada County and the connector as part of Idaho Transportation Department's Adopt a Highway program. So we went to check it out and while there was some trash and some clutter and weeds along that section Corliss was concerned about, it didn't seem like a ridiculous amount to us. In fact, we asked the coordinator of the District 3, the Adopt a Highway program about this, which covers all of Southwest Idaho from Riggins in the north to Glens Ferry in the east. She tells us the Sheriff's Office and their alternative sentencing labor detail is probably the best group in the whole state when it comes to taking care of its sections of the highways. They probably pick up 300 bags a month off the interstate and connector. But with all the new people coming in and all the traffic, it just fills up as soon as we pick it up. It seems like and they do pick it up almost as often as it's put down. The Ada County Sheriff's Office says their labor detail groups are out on the connector every Wednesday and sometimes more often. It's just a part of the 35 miles or so of interstate they do clean up. All of last year, the Sheriff's Office collected more than 4,600 bags in nearly 14,000 hours of work. That's a lot of trash, but there's still some spots that need some attention. All told in District 3, there are 2,600 27 miles of road in the adopt a highway program, 67% of which are already accounted for. So that leaves 867 miles of highway in Southwest Idaho that is up for adoption. If it's not adopted, it's up to our group, our maintenance people, but of course they have roadways to maintain and potholes and you know, so it gets towards the bottom as far as litter pickup because we're trying to keep everybody safe on the road. So it kind of gets pushed, pushed down the priority list, but Janet does say they get calls all the time about litter along the road and she'll pass that along to the group or person who has adopted that section. If it's not adopted, 
she'll let the people who are calling, she'll let them know it's available and it's easy. It's a two year commitment and ITD only requires you to clean it up twice a year. That's it, just twice a year. It's also free. ITD will provide road signs, trash bags, and even safety vests. So thanks for the message, Corliss. And if you or anyone else want to be part of the we that should be doing a better job out there, reach out and get yourself a one or two mile stretch of road and fill a few bags. Wanted to start with this beautiful time lapse from the sawtooth camera up in Stanley. Gorgeous with that sun angle just right in the camera lens there to give us those glares of sunshine. It was a cold start in Stanley today. 20 below zero made it to seven below zero in McCall to start early this morning. And this is what many of the area kiddos headed out into the bus stop and early this morning in the upper teens and low 20s. And I point that out because that's where we'll be again tomorrow morning, if not a degree or two colder. Clear sky. That is really what will happen when you have clear skies. Wanted to give you a ski report as well for our area ski resorts. Bogus Basin with a base of 65 inches, 38 inches at the base at Tamarack. I'll move out of the way here for these numbers as well. With the clear skies, lots of sunshine, fresh snow that we had over the weekend. Great skiing conditions all across the state. Current temperatures running just a few degrees below seasonal averages. 40 degrees in Boise right now. Tonight, again, falling back off into the teens and low 20s underneath clear skies, light winds, and then tomorrow we do it all over again. 39 to 44, so our temperatures for tomorrow afternoon, very similar to what we experienced this afternoon. This is a look at our high temperatures expected for tomorrow afternoon. Underneath, once again, lots of sunshine in place. High pressure is in control for us, but right now we're currently in this little bubble of some cooler temperatures for us. Eventually, the milder air will slide in from the west, but as it does so, that's when we're expecting our next storm system as well. So the weekend has temperatures up around 50 degrees for Saturday and Sunday. But look what's in store for Sunday, ushering in our next round of precipitation and also some very windy conditions Sunday into Monday. Mild temperatures looking like mainly rain for the valley locations. Here's a look at the seven day forecast with those gradually warming temperatures heading into the weekend. First half of the weekend looks fantastic with a high near 50 degrees and then it's back to more seasonable temperatures temperatures and dry conditions into next week for a fresh forecast any time of the day. You can visit KTVB.com. You looking to buy a piece of Ada County history? It may cost you a cool million, but you could then at least call yourself a purveyor of power. And this Idaho law got our attention for its use of unintended imagery. Are you looking to get our attention? Send us a text, the number 208-321-5614. Whether it's a question, comment, a complaint, we want to hear about it. We might read some of them coming up at the end of the show.
You still have a shot of being a damn owner, a proprietor of hydropower, but you only have a few weeks left to kick the tires, as it were. A few of Barber Dam's potential buyers had their first chance to take an up close look at the concrete this morning. Back in December, Ada County's 116 year old hydroelectric power plant was put up for auction. The county has owned the dam since the mid 70s after the original owners, well, they failed to pay taxes on the property. So how much hydropower would you be in possession of? Well, the dam puts out up to 3.8 megawatts of electricity, which is enough to power about 3,800 homes. It might be a bit of a fixer upper, though. In recent years, the dam has had its share of problems, including a power outage last summer that stopped the entire flow of the Boise River. Wow, which the county was, of course, fined for about $50,000. Along with that structure itself, you're going to get a few surrounding parcels of land, but you only have two days to put down a deposit to prove you are a serious auction contender. How much is that deposit? $100,000. The county is asking for a minimum bid of $1 million. And you have until March 29th before the water flows begin to fill in for the spring. That's how long you have to go out and check it out. If you missed out on today, though, you can get a damn close up view next Tuesday coming up on February 25th from 1 to 5. All right, we're going to be right back here on the 208. But first, to answer this guy's question, thought, why not wear a tank top with cutoffs? See what happens. Well, I'll tell you what will happen. I wouldn't be able to live with myself. I don't know that I ever will wear a tank top with cutoffs, at least not together. Stick around. We'll be right back. Last week, we told you about two Idaho laws that are still in effect today. Sex before marriage and adultery, both technically still illegal in the gem state. And while we were looking into those laws, we stumbled upon another that kind of piqued our interest. And it reads, blind persons only may use red or white, or I should say white or red and white canes. This law passed, by the way, back in 1937. Anyone else's mind kind of go toward a candy cane looking thing? Well, some of ours did. We reached out to the Idaho Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired and asked them if there was a reason behind this law, why they had to be red or red and white canes, or white, excuse me, and red and white canes. 
Didn't get an answer back for them, but we did a little bit more digging ourselves. And in the United Kingdom in 1921, after an accident claimed his sight, a man by the name of James Biggs decided to paint his walking stick white to make himself more visible to motorists. Well, 10 years later, the Lions Club Internationals Internationals Lions Clubs International jumped on board and they created a national campaign promoting the use of white canes with a red band for people who suffer from blindness. The white cane then took on a symbolic role as an identifier of the blind and the visually impaired. The Lions Club says white cane laws exist in almost every state in the United States, including Idaho, and those who violate the law can be charged with a misdemeanor, meaning if you use a cane that isn't white or red and white, you could spend up to six months in jail and up to a thousand dollar fine. Wow, pretty stiff. All right, when we come back. We're going to get to some of your comments and questions about today's show. Some of them like these.